Uh, I guess it's 7.15, let's get started. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I have to say the, the fun of this of actually just seeing all these faces is very nice. I wanna reach out and say hi and hug everybody. Um, uh, Yulin, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, and uh, I wanted to talk to you about uh, the state and the budget and efforts that are going on up there. So um, you, uh, you voted against a key provision of the budget a couple of weeks ago and uh, made quite an impassioned speech around that, which uh, I think a number of people got to see online. Uh, I sent the YouTube clip out, but I can send it around to everybody else too. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about what that meant to you and uh, uh, sure. whether 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 that uh, whether whether it can have any effect on what's happening next? Um, and uh, um, well, yeah, if you can tell us where that vote came from, I think that would be helpful. Yeah. So, um, as folks know, uh, I I feel like um, this public health crisis is such a huge one and we just we really can't be cutting medicaid cutting our community Yulene, i just lost you can you hear me um stuck in a place mm -hmm. where we're not getting the things that we need are you guys able to hear me uh for me you cut out there for a second but maybe that's just okay. me um, no, you I, cut I'll out. Start. Sorry, I couldn't hear what. I, I think you cut out for a minute during that first answer. So. Okay. So yeah. So I just wanted to let folks know that um, you know it was a very, very uh, difficult um, moment for all of us because I knew that um, you know they were still going to have the votes, but at the same time, uh, we got very, very close this year. Uh, you know, this was um, a very bad budget, I would have to say, um, more so than any other year, uh, because, you know, we are in a public health crisis right now. Uh, we are in a health crisis, and we have a budget that is trying to cut Medicaid, we have a health budget that we have a budget that is trying to cut community health centers. We have a budget that is trying to cut essential services from us and our social benefits programs. And it's just, it was one that made me feel very hurt and very frustrated because um, the things that we had asked for were not in the budget. The things that our communities desperately need were not in the budget. And we were deciding to do that. We were deciding on austerity and, uh, instead of raising revenue. Um, you know, we're not the federal government. We can't print money, but what we can do on the state level is we can tax and we can also um, be sure to uh, borrow, right? So there are two different ways that we can raise revenue. And we had a whole slew of uh, bills, including a couple of mine, um, on how to raise that revenue. And we, uh, instead of, you know, making sure that we had some budget justice and, you know, uh, tax multimillionaires and billionaires just a little bit, uh, we decided that we were going to cut education funding um, and healthcare funding when we need it the most, when we have students who are missing school, when we have, um, you know, no hospital beds, when we have, uh, you know, a need for our healthcare networks. Uh, we didn't fund things for our seniors. We didn't fund uh, extra for um, our NORCs. We desperately need that healthcare network now and we didn't uh, do that. And so that was why I felt like it was so important for us to stand up and um, say that this is not the budget that we want. So as you can tell on the assembly side, um, we got very close, we were one vote away. And so I think it sent a statement and it sent a, uh, a very strong message to the governor um, that, you know, that, that this is not something that conscientiously and morally um, was something that many of us could stand by. Can you tell me a little bit about the timing of how it all came together? So presumably that budget was prepared before we were in the middle of a crisis. 
and then you were all asked to vote on it essentially as this was unfolding, right? The last week of March. So the budget was, was not prepared before the crisis. The, the executive budget came out, um, you know, while we already knew that there was going to be a public health uh, event, right? We knew that something was going to be happening. And um, I had already talked to them about maybe um, looking uh, at figuring out some kind of way for us to be able to vote remotely. By mid-January, I was already talking to folks about um, our small businesses suffering here in lower Manhattan, you know? And I think that one of the biggest things that people, um, people uh, didn't realize was that, you know, it was going to be as big as it was. Um, but I think that, you know, I kind of anticipated it. Uh, I kind of anticipated the fact that we wouldn't have the, um, the healthcare system and the infrastructure that we needed because what we need is we really need infrastructure. We need um, to invest. We don't need to be cutting, right? Um, we learned that through history. We learned that through history very, very clearly that you know, while we are going through um, a recession, we cannot cut our way to fixing that problem. We need to invest in our infrastructure. Um, you know, there was an actual written plan in our district felt the brunt of it. There's a written plan of cutting and shedding hospital beds, yeah. right? And, and Mount Sinai, St. Vincent's, those were both uh, hospitals that uh, had hospital beds that we shed, right? And they became luxury condos. And, um, and that's uh, something that cost our district. And, in, and that's on a personal personal level, but then also on, on, on the greater grand scheme of things, uh, we're seeing that that was a mistake by our state, right? And that should have not been part of the MRT plan. That should not have been part of MRT2 plan. And, and instead, what we should have been looking at is actually universal health care. <laughs> and you see that with other countries who have had it uh, for several years, they responded a lot better. Um, you know, you see South Korea, you see Taiwan, you see Germany, and you see like how, how their um, emphasis on a public health uh, structure has really changed a lot of the way that they've uh, responded. And I think that, you know, just to kind of give some statistics I, I, and, and, and um, some of the uh, numbers that were in the budget versus like what we asked for, I think that you'll see like the reasoning behind it. Um, I also wanted to kind of put a plug and Johnson can help me out here, but we do have on Friday our uh, town hall uh, to discuss the budget. So, um, you know, please have everybody come um, and also, you know, make sure that you, uh, you know, let me know your questions as well, um, because it'll help me to be able to answer everybody else's questions. So I already see like on here, like Ty was asking about um, uh, the REM freeze bill. So I can talk about that a little bit as well. Um, but you, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm actually just, uh, I'm, I'm curious about the timing and, and this is sort of where it comes from is, um, do you think, I, I understand that you guys, that the executive budget was released at a time when we sort of knew this stuff was coming down the pike, but presumably all the work that the, uh, that the executive branch was doing on this budget takes, takes months in advance. I, I'm, I'm wondering if you think the governor was, uh, did he prepare a budget and then decided not to change it based on the circumstances no, that's not how the budgeting process works. So what they do is their their um, executive budget comes out, and then we have our one house budgets that have mm -hmm. also, um, you know, put in our input, and then we come out with a one budget um, for the vote, right? And that's like through negotiations, and that's in real time, right? The negotiations are happening right before the vote, and yeah, so that was um, happening like the third week of March, basically third and yeah, fourth week so, of March. Okay, correct. So they knew, like, I mean, this is like. And, and yet to remember, they had several weeks while we were also, um, you know, spread to the four winds <laughs> uh, after we had uh, discovered that there were members who were, who were ill. Um, then we uh, were not called back in until the next week after. Um, there was a whole week in between. And uh, so there was a lot of negotiating in between there before we had to vote on the budget. 
So it's, is it, uh, is it short-sightedness or is it, uh, is it deliberate austerity in the face of a crisis? It was deliberate austerity and by design. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, folks know that um, we have spoken about it before. We, uh, like many, many of my colleagues and I have already talked about, um, you know, revenue raising and budget justice even before um, mm -hmm. we knew that there was going to be this health crisis. And mm -hmm. we know now even more so that we were correct in asking for these changes because, you know, how is it possible that we are not, you know, getting that Medicaid match? How is it possible that we're not asking for our community health centers to not be fully funded? These are all things that we've been fighting for on our end, um, and we've been asking for a raise in revenue. We know that the um, the budget cap that everybody talks about, uh, that everybody knows about, is one that is actually uh, arbitrary, put in by Cuomo himself, actually. The 2% cap is what we call mm -hmm. it. It's um, the 2% cap that he always talks about is like the limit and the ceiling for the budget. And that's something that is arbitrarily decided by him. And it's not actually based off of what the revenue of the state raises, according to Tom DiNapoli. So. I mean, these are things that we already knew that he wanted to do, and these are things that he took uh, advantage of a public health crisis to do because he knew that the deliberations would have to end, and um, and uh, you know he has, uh, as many people have pointed out, um, an incredible amount of popularity. Uh, people are talking about him as in like the second coming, you know. So we, we talked a lot about how um, after the Democrats took over the Senate, 2019 was, yep. uh, was a phenomenal year legislatively in Albany. Um, obviously, it doesn't mean that uh, progressives got absolutely everything they wanted, but it was such a big step forward after so many years. Um, does, does this now feel like... Uh, uh, like the progressive causes hit a brick wall? Has it backtracked? What, 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 happens, what happens next with a lot of those broader goals that you're talking about? Well, first off, we need to ask for our legislature to actually come back into session. I think that um, I have asked for it multiple times. I think that we need our, our, our community to actually stand up and fight for that. Um, you know, we need to advocate for that and we need to join a lot of the voices around the state that have been fighting for these things because, you know, if we don't have the policy discussions, then we're not able to vote on the on the policy issues that we care about, right? And um, we still have a lot of things that we are prioritizing right now, um, and that we need to make sure to get passed. And um, and we know that some of these things might even be able to raise revenue. Um, and so, you know, I think that it's really really important. What I'm very disappointed about, which you touched a little bit on, is that, you know, basically, folks know um, that on the state level, we could have been the cushion for the blow. Right, uh, we could have been a big cushion for less of a hit to the people. Mm -hmm. um, for so for three to five years, maybe we would have a very difficult time balancing the budget, but we would be able to, you know, kind of fix that by doing certain, you know, things like raising revenue, certain things by making sure that we are, um, you know, balancing some of the priorities a little bit differently, and. Uh, instead, we're like investing fully into uh, our state's infrastructure. And, and by the way, our state is like the economic driver, right? Our city is the economic driver for our state. Our state is an economic driver for our country. And we are a huge, um, you know, uh, I guess, big stopgap when it comes to um, the dominoes that will fall for our entire country's economy, right? But instead of cushioning that blow on the state level, we're basically saying, you know, that we're not going to do that cushioning and we're going to allow for the dominoes to fall and come what may, you know, and that's going to be decades of, um, of hurt for our, our, for our working families. So you're looking, you're looking to get back to work. Is there any, is there any plan for a legislative session? Can it be done remotely? Are there... Well, I yeah, I did hear, I mean, this is a little rumor, right, that, that you know, because we did get calls to get our computers, <laughs> like, you know, get our computer programs up. So, like, that is a, a good sign. You know, I think that that okay. means that they're going to try to get us to at least be able to conference remotely on a couple of items. And I think that that might 
be a good uh, thing to hear. Um, I have not heard for sure in either way, whether or not we're not or we are. Um, you know, we, we, we uh, vote at the call of the speaker. And so we um, don't get to really get to decide. Um, but, you know, there has to be some pressure coming from somewhere. Uh, and that pressure, I mean, is like, you know, me putting, you know, all of our folks um, to to call his office and call the governor and to say that we demand our legislature to be back in session and that we want um, certain things like uh, policy wise uh, to be discussed. You know, I think that it's it's really crucial right now. And it's a crucial thing uh, that should not be uh, overlooked. And, you know, I would love for our club's help in getting that voice out and getting people on the ground shouting for this change, you know, in um, and, and making sure that our, our, our legislators are actually able to vote um, because you, you guys deserve representation. What, what do you think that agenda would look like if you guys were able to come back in the next, for, the, for six more weeks? Yeah, so I think some of it would be, um, really rapidly. I think that one of the biggest things would be uh, protecting elections. I think that some of the stuff that uh, I've been talking about, as you probably know, um, is making sure that folks are able to sign up for an absentee ballot. Um, there has been a lot of uh, discussion on that front as well. Um, I think it's, you know, we saw what happened with Wisconsin and we saw, you know, what we don't want to happen in New York and, um, you know, BOE has suffered its own losses. And so we need to make sure that, you know, we are uh, very cognizant of keeping our workers safe, our poll workers safe and um, making yeah. sure that we're making some good decisions on that front. Uh, I think that, um, you know, uh, making sure that people in the city are, were, are able to actually sign up electronically for absentee ballots is a really big one, but then also making sure that um, it's mailed out to folks. Like I think that all registered voters should be getting a mailer of some sort that basically says that, you know, that has the absentee ballot form and can make it so that they can just, it already has the return postage and can readily be sent back to BOE. I think that that is critical um, because there are so many folks in our district that don't have internet. There's so many folks across the state that don't have internet. And there's a lot of people who um, are very, very much used to, um, you know, uh, a paper fill out sign up. And so I think that it's, uh, it's a good thing to make sure that, you know, people who can't afford a printer, can't get paper, can't get a stamp, are still able to practice um, and, and be able to get their, their vote in. There, there was a news report yesterday that the governor was preparing an executive order that would have, uh, I'm not sure if it was absentee ballot applications or actual absentee ballots mailed to every voter. Do you, do you have any idea if that's happening? I think that it was the application. So I think that, you know, we had been talking about it with him and his office and we've been getting good response. Um, they have the same uh, worry as us about safety, I think, on that front. And so the conversation has been going well. Um, but, uh, you know, of course, the dream would be to be able to get the actual absentee ballots in the mail. Um, but of course, we also know that the runway is so short. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's like by ED by ED, like it's very difficult to kind of um, guarantee uh, that we would have all of those things ready and uh, be able to get it all counted, etc. So I understand the difficulty. I just also know that, um, you know, it, it like other states, for example, who have like complete mail-in ballots um, had had a runway of like a year or a year and a half, whereas we have not. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's really important that we are cognizant of that. Um, but the absentee ballot, uh, I mean, the absentee um, application itself, uh, if it went out to everybody, it would be the same print and it would be like to everybody and it would be a, a very easy thing to do since we do voter guides we do um right. we, we send out the uh cards for everyone we send out you know all of the voter um uh you know information to everyone so that i think would be very doable from you know county county municipality city etc but these are all decisions at this point being made by the governor yes is that right yes. yeah um, yeah, and, and I mean, we, we gave him our powers. And I think that that is also one of the things that makes it so that 
uh, he doesn't want to have to call us back. I think that he's saying like, well, he's already made many comments about how the legislature is done with session. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that's worrisome for us because, um, you know, having a lot of different voices at the table make it so that we have better policy. Um, that's the whole point of having a legislature, right? Because everybody has different perspectives that really lends to what makes it strong, like makes a policy piece strong. And I think that we need to make sure that we are actually at the table to be able to do that. Uh, so you mentioned one of the comments here, but Ty was asking uh, if you could comment on the rent freeze yeah. bill. Yeah, happy to. So um, I am the sponsor of the uh, the rent forgiveness bill. Um, I don't really call it a freeze because it's not like a freeze and then you have to pay later. It's a forgiveness bill. And I think that it's really important that we have um, something that will help folks um, to kind of be that stopgap for the domino effect that we would see um, coming because as folks know, um, rent is hard right now. <laughs> um, I don't even know how to better um, give the uh, actual example of it, except for the fact that like my partner and I, for example, um, I make a pretty decent salary, right? Like it's a normal salary, low by New York standards, but New York City standards, but decent, right? Livable. Um, my uh, rent takes up 50% of my income. And, you know, for my partner, he uh, he does shows for a living, live, live shows. And so it's hard to um, be able to do that now, <laughs> obviously, no matter how talented he is, no matter how great um, he is. And uh, it, it uh, makes it so that if I'm to pay 100% of our rent, that would be 100% of my income, which is the only income that we have now, which makes it very difficult for us to uh, buy food to eat and to raise this giant beast that I call a dog. And so <laughs> you know, I think that it's, um, it's, it's this, that my, my story is not unique, right? And it's, it's actually one of the better ones. And we're seeing that, you know, a lot of people who are um, actually in, uh, in a particular um, situation of like having both parents work or having all the kids at home or, you know, every single thing makes it so much more difficult right now to um, make, make ends meet. So, uh, you know, being able to um, have the biggest expense in New York City <laughs> be something that you don't have to be scared of having to pay a lump sum of at the end of 90 days when you don't know if you might even have work again or if you might be able to, um, you know, even if you have your job back and you are able to work again, um, make like that much in how, how long do you have? <laughs> like literally like one week to be able to make back all of the three months that you lost. It's not possible, right? So I think that, you know, we have to be very realistic and we have to make sure that folks are um, not trapped into a cycle of debt and poverty just based off of a public health crisis and we as the government should be helping out. And so, um, so this bill would make it so that uh, there would be a forgiveness of rent for uh, three months and, uh, and, you know, there would be a attaching bill, um, as you guys have probably seen already, for small landlords uh, to be able to pull from a fund that we put together, um, just like the Hurricane Sandy natural disaster relief um, that we were able to do for um, some of the uh, buildings that were affected there. So we're trying to make it so that there is an attached uh, mm -hmm. fund to make sure that we don't have, um, we don't have, uh, you know, the domino effect of, you know, having small landlords also not being able to pay their taxes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So like, um, it makes it so that there is a cushion and that there is a window and uh, people are able to actually be able to get by. And what about, uh, uh, what about mortgages? Oh, and so that's also included. <laughs> <laughs> mortgages are included in my bill as are commercial rents. So, uh, those, so those are two things that I think that people don't realize are part of the bill because they're always like, oh my gosh, it's my own, my own, my own rent. But um, we, we know that our small businesses uh, have such a small window of runway or whatever that they have a cushion of um, to be able to uh, stay afloat and they have long past that. So a lot of folks are not able to make their rent right now. Um, if you are a restaurant or a small business that, um, you know, depended uh, on your day-to-day -day sales. Uh, it made it so that, you know, uh, we, we are basically helping to make sure that there's a buffer for those folks. Uh, and I've got one uh, member here, Emily, who's asking specifically about uh, nonprofit affordable housing owners uh, yeah. who 
can't absorb the loss of rent. Uh, so how, how, how do they end up getting protected exactly from all of this? So um, right now, our bills are not passed, so nobody's protected. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, that's one of the things that we need to work on. Um, but you know, uh, we do have a couple of other bills. Uh, Maritza Davila did one uh, for um, nonprofit uh, uh, home owners, so like AFI, et cetera, like groups that mm -hmm. um, are like the landlords for many uh, small um, buildings or for larger buildings, et cetera. So it's the nonprofit. So there is a, a voucher program from the state that they are trying to put together for that. Um, that is also somewhat attached to the bill that Brian Kavanaugh has proposed on voucher systems. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that, you know, of course, um, uh, the, I saw a question on here about co-op carrying charges. I think that, um, you know, we also have to probably look into that part because the, there's so many different pieces because we we didn't include utilities either for um, anybody and we know that those are also charges that are going to be very difficult for folks um so it's kind of um it's kind of just like you know we try to take care of one piece uh at a time but we know that it's difficult for everyone and we're trying to make sure that you know the the bills make sense and we have um another uh uh piece on I wonder, who, I wonder who ended up carrying it, but I do know that we had been talking about util and uh, co-op carrying charges in that one piece as well. So if the legislature does not come back into session, mm -hmm. what, what, what's the level of special powers that the governor has right now and uh, for how long does he have them? For as long as we are declared in a state of emergency and he has, he's basically, uh, legislature and governor right now. And, and, uh, and he decides when the state of emergency is lifted? Um, yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, so a rent freeze or forgiveness, I mean, these kinds of things that you're talking about could still happen through executive order. Uh, they can. They can, but um, according to our governor, he says that uh, with his uh, no eviction declaration, uh, or actually, hopefully people won't evict people is what he basically said. And then uh -huh. in for 90 days, um, and uh, basically also said that mortgages um, will be, you know, pushed back for 90 days, um, but that's it. Uh, he thinks that that solved the problem. That's what he said. Mm -hmm. And we know uh, it's not true because I'm living it daily. Yeah, I mean, I I think we're all we're all still in the middle of figuring out how how big this problem really is, and uh, and what kinds of solutions are going to be are going to be possible. It's 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 so huge. It's hard to talk about one little piece of policy. And as soon as you start talking about that, like you're saying, you're not talking about utilities, you're not talking about this. There's so many different places where uh, the system that we're used to is falling apart. Yep. Uh, so it's still hard to really, I mean, for me at least, to really comprehend what is gonna be needed to, to pull things together. Um, percent I'm with you, Jeremy, and I need your help on this because we all know how hard it's going to be. And I think that that's, that you hit it on the head, right? I think that it's really hard to wrap all of our minds around all of the different policy repercussions that this is going to have. Um, and I think that when we are talking about, um, you know, for example, uh, making sure that our public schools can have the resources that they need. Oh man, like I don't even know how to start on how difficult that has been, right? We have seen that because of um, our unpreparedness, uh, the kids who are in our school system that are homeless, they're going to be so far behind. And now, now they're starting to take attendance. And it's like, what if you don't have internet? What if your parents are not able to stand in line for you for a laptop because you have no parents? Like there are, there are so many people left behind right now that 
it is, it's like one thing after another, one thing after another. And then you, you cannot, like, you cannot imagine how many, like, I, I literally stay up at night just thinking about all these policy repercussions. And I think about, you know, what it is that we're, we're missing. And, and these questions, they, when you open one box, you have like six other things pop out. You know, when you're looking at, you know, just the fact that like kids need laptops. Okay, remote learning. Well, how are they getting them? How, how, have, how is it possible if some kids haven't gotten them? And then what if they don't have internet? And even if, you know, free internet is being given out, what if they have no place to be <laughs> for internet service? You know, what if they're not in one location because they're being shifted from shelter to shelter to shelter? What if, you know, there's like, there's so many different things that are going on that we can't answer every single policy like repercussion because, because every single second, there's another issue that pops up. So, you know, we're trying our best here, but at the same time, it's woefully inadequate because we didn't do the first and biggest steps and we didn't take that cushion and blow ourselves first and foremost. Um, and, and it hurts because I know that there were so many things that we could have prevented. Uh, I have a, another member, John, who's asking about unemployment insurance. Uh, okay. He's been trying um, for close to a month to get that completed do you, do you, i know that there were some improvements made uh, there was some improvement. the, the filing but do you know if that's actually getting things through or is there yes and no <laughs> um all right so we should have a whole discussion on ppp and we should have a whole discussion on um uap and we should be talking about these things and i i would love to be able to actually do like a a more thorough um discussion on both things so um, you know, first off, come to the town hall, come, you know, not really come physically, but, you know, zoom into the town hall and, you know, let's talk about it. But um, we have a, a list of folks that we've been, um, you know, who told us that they've been having issues or that they applied, and we've been helping to make sure that there's a direct linkage into getting folks the help that they need. And um, yes, like, it's difficult uh, to get through. Um, we've had the, the first group of people that applied literally are getting punished for being, a, you know, the first group to apply and having needs first because, you know, they're needing to wait right now for callbacks if they've already finished half, half their application. Um, and now there's like this new system where some people have gotten callbacks a lot quicker than others. And so there's a little bit of backwardsness going on, but the system yeah. is getting a little bit faster. And we have been very helpful in our office, been um, being able to help get people the, the connection that they need. And people have been getting callbacks um, when we've been putting them on the list. And so like, if, if folks need help, please contact my office. I, uh, we have uh, the, the process down pat now. <laughs> so yeah, if you need help, please uh, help us to get your information. And Johnson is on the chat here. And so yeah. um, you guys can get his contact as well. John, do you want to okay. speak to that? Yeah, I think I guess I'm one of those lucky unlucky people who <laughs> like I waited like just a little too long until like uh, I guess the employment started getting slammed and now I, I missed one phone call, I think from um, the Department of, of Labor and and now um, Now you have to wait. Uh, yeah, I, I, there's nothing I can call. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I'll be in touch with your office. Maybe if you could help with that, that would be very much appreciated. We can help with that. And um, it's been, it, it's so frustrating because like I literally am dealing with it like right there. <laughs> and so it's like, yeah. it, it's, it's, um, it's, it's been very hard for folks to apply, but um, at the same time, we've been able to get their callbacks a little bit faster for folks um, yeah. because people, what, the first time that uh, uh, DOL calls, you don't even know it's DOL. Mm -hmm. They leave you a message. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, we yeah. get so many robocalls in this freaking district that like people don't even know that it's like you know DOL calling. It's it's not like yeah. it's, it's just you know labor, you know. Um. Yeah, and I think more. Hi, I'm sorry uh, to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt. My name is Frida, and I just wanted to mention that the assembly member and her staff were absolutely phenomenal in helping someone that I recommended there that needed help with getting um their unemployment information submitted to the DOL. So thank you and kudos to you and your team. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, that, that's great. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, John, I just want to say that like, I think it's also like it affects the rent issue, right? Because if people aren't getting unemployment benefits, 
And so I think it's like, it really is, uh, I mean, I know it's a big, probably um, logistical mess, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, what they're doing, but the, the, the quicker they can do that, I think the quicker it, it, it brings the pressure off these other issues. 100%. And I mean- uh, So John, just check the chat. I think Johnson yeah. left the uh, phone number and uh, email address to check in with Eileen's office. Yeah, it's unprecedented. They might have just hit the 40 minute limit here. Yeah, 50% of the city is unemployed right now. Thank you. Yeah. Is it me or is, are we frozen? Is he frozen? <laughs> I see everybody else waving, but I think Jeremy's frozen. Is, is that okay? He is frozen. He, All right. he yeah, said Jeremy. something about 40, 40 minute limit and then um there he okay. goes he's back oh, okay he's back okay hi jeremy are you there you lean, For me, yes, did you, hi yes i am here you lean, did you Sorry say 50 percent of the city's unemployed yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah a lot of my unions right now are are telling me about the actual numbers and like you know of course like the, a lot of the essential workers um are not even getting the things that they need and um you know we've been trying to get them the help that they need um i've been like linking them even with my own personal friends and contacts out in like you know asia <laughs> like i was like taiwan yeah sure we'll, we'll talk to the embassy in taiwan we'll talk to uh the chinese government we'll talk to you know this like random company in like the south of like you know france and be like you know like hello like let's let's get some help and so we've been getting um you know folks ppes and things like that and then um my family has been really generous in being able to donate some for for me to give out to folks in the district you know um we've been trying to make sure that folks who can help uh uh you know can can actually help you know and so um you know it's been it's been really hard um and you know some of the unions have told me that uh you know like 32 bj that's our doormen our service workers people who clean the buildings they've they've already seen 40,000 layoffs mm. and uh almost um i think it's 72 deaths so you know these are people who have been on the front lines trying to make sure that we have clean uh, cleaners and folks who are, you know, our school crossing guards, um, you know, from DC 37, for example, and then our, our uh, hospital cleaners um, from DC 37, um, you know, it's, it's been tough. It's been tough. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, we're approaching eight o'clock. I told you, Lynn, she only had to stick around until 745. I think she, I think she said she's got something else to run to. So I don't want to. Yeah. Keep I do have any longer. I basically live on Zoom now, so right. I'm also wearing my college sweatshirt. But um, um, yeah, anytime you guys need me, and um, please come on Friday and join in on the budget discussion. Um, I can definitely talk much more in depth um, about all of the different votes because I actually had something prepped for you guys, but I didn't even get to go through it. So um, <laughs> please, like, let me know if there's any questions that you have, like John, or if there's any other. Oh my gosh. Hello, she's so cute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she's the best. She's all grown now. Um, but yeah, so if you guys have any questions or any kinds of, um, you know, issues, personal things that you need, please feel free to reach out to me as you all have my cell phone number. Um, I will put it on the, the chat again for everyone. This is just, um, you know, I actually, Johnson, will you just put it on there? Cause I have to run, but um, you know, I have two cell phone numbers. One's a 917 number, the other's a 360 number. Um, both of them, are totally uh, you know off the same phone it's really ones for my grandma uh, before when she thought it was an area code that she needed to dial um, and so you can call either one <laughs> and um, and you know please uh, you know if you if you if you need anything um, whether it's hot hot meals um, whether it's groceries delivered to your door whether it's um, a PPE mask or anything like that please contact me. Um, I, I want to make sure that folks in the district um, are feeling safe and get the things that you need. Okay. Um, so if there's anything that, if there's anything that I can help with, please let us know because we can't help unless we know about it. So, yeah. Uh, okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, listen, if everybody else wants to just hang on for another couple of minutes, I had a couple of quick announcements uh, for the club and some other activities going on. Um, one is, uh, we didn't get a chance to announce this, and I'm still not exactly sure what this is going to look like in the fall, but uh, 
we, uh, as, 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 as a club, we're joining in with a, a larger um, effort happening in Manhattan called Vote Blue. It's a PAC that's been uh, created for uh, campaigning in the fall uh, for buses to Pennsylvania and other swing districts. Uh, the plan, at least before this, we all got shut down, uh, was to have buses going every weekend starting Labor Day. Um, uh, where those buses would go was going to be determined later in the summer, depending on what polls look like and which districts needed um, needed our help. Um, I was uh, I was we were prepared uh, to uh, uh, donate from the club seven hundred and fifty dollars for that effort, and I was also going to be reaching out to everybody for some small donations uh, because the way the pack works, it needs a certain number of donations. Uh, even at very small amounts, uh, to qualify for um, to qualify to be a multi-candidate pack. So there are a lot of um, uh, logistic things that go into this. Uh, all this to say is, uh, obviously, none of us know what campaigning in the fall is going to look like. Uh, but we're going to uh, stay in touch with uh, with that organization. It's it's basically a lot of other uh, clubs like ours, uh, mostly from downtown. Um, uh, but also other parts of Manhattan and a few in Brooklyn. Uh, these were people who actually put together a lot of buses in uh, uh, in 2018 for some uh, successful congressional races. Uh, so they're they're building off of a lot of work that they've already done, and um, uh, and we were hoping to uh, really organize and help out with that effort. Obviously, there's still a very large political problem in this country, um, uh, and he's and he's in the White House uh, giving press briefings every evening that are, that are crazy. So uh, we are gonna try to be involved in that in whatever way we can. Uh, also wanna let you know that um, uh, we'll, we will continue to partner with Sister District. I think they'll be part of that overall Vote Blue Pack, but they have some of their own targeting that they do. Uh, and there will be coming up even um, uh, opportunities to do phone banking, which we can all do from home. Uh, maybe to do some postcarding, which we can all do from home, and I'm going to uh, start letting people know what those efforts are like, so that we can uh, 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 get our get our mind set again toward fall campaigns. Um, oh, Emily's here. She says she can give a quick sister district update. Want to yeah. go ahead? Hi, so um, I'm part of Sister District. Um, we're focused on state level elections that have the potential to flip from red to blue. Um, and we've been, we started like right after the 2016 election. So this is now we're going into our fourth cycle. The way it works is there's like a national team that does a ton of research on um, w across the country, which races are strategic and could really benefit from volunteer um, support and fundraising. And so our New York chapter just got our assignments of our two races for this year. One of them is in Pennsylvania. Um, his name is Jonathan Casa is the candidate. And and the other one is actually in North Carolina. So I don't expect that we'll be traveling to North Carolina, um, regardless of whatever the shutdown restrictions are. Uh, but uh, And that candidate's name is Sarah Crawford. Um, so we're going to be doing phone banking, postcarding, um, fundraising. We did our first attempt at a virtual fundraiser uh, this weekend for Sarah Crawford. We did a screening online of a documentary um, and had a discussion after. We raised about $900 for her campaign. So we're off and running um, and we'll have some, you know, events coming up soon and we'll make sure that Grand Street Dems is looped in. Yeah, I, I, I get all of those emails and I've been, uh, I've been pretty horrible over the last six weeks of uh, getting things going, but I, I, I promise to do a better job and we'll include Sister District in that uh, going forward. Um, thanks, Emily. Um, uh, Jim's got a question here about the June primary. Is that up in the air? Uh, I know I don't believe the June primary is up in the air. I think the June primary is, as far as everybody's saying, is still going to happen. Uh, I think there was still some question about whether the uh, presidential primary would be part of that. Um, and, and I guess I don't really know the answer to that. I'm having a hard time understanding how they could get rid of that completely, especially if we're already going to the polls for our, for our uh, state and congressional races. Um, but uh, 
but yes, sorry, this, the note here is that the presidential primary was supposed to be the end of April. That has been postponed until June 23rd, which is when the other primaries are for state and congressional candidates. Um, uh, so I believe, I believe that's where we're at. And we talked a little bit with Eileen about um, how absentee ballots were gonna get distributed. Uh, you can go online, download your own application for an absentee ballot um, and make sure that gets sent out to you. Um, I think the checkbox to check is something like temporary illness. It just doesn't, it doesn't matter this year if you have a reason or not, uh, you can get an absentee ballot if you want. Um, uh, Carolyn or Lee, are there any other issues that I'm uh, ignoring? None that uh, that I can think of. I'm just grateful to see so many uh, so many faces, so many people. Yeah, uh, I can't think of anything either. Really, Carolyn, we're glad you've recovered. Uh, I did, by the way, for those of you who know her, I did get a, a text the other day from Daisy Paez, who, uh, who was very sick. Uh, she is recovering. She's, uh, uh, she said she's trying to regain some lung capacity, uh, but she sounded hopeful and uh, um, uh, we'll definitely be glad to see her back around the neighborhood. Uh, where is she, Jeremy? Is she in a uh, rehab unit now or still in the hospital? I, I, I guess I don't know the answer to that, no. She's, okay. Uh, I believe she's not home. Yeah. Um, but I don't know, I don't know physically where she is. Okay. Um, all right, then I think that's it. Uh, we'll try to do this again in a couple of weeks. If we can keep it short, hopefully we can do a few more of these. Uh, I'm desperate to introduce you guys to some candidates, city candidates for 2021. Um, and as, as crazy it is to talk about something other than COVID, I think, I think we'll, we'll start getting back into the swing of things and, uh, um, uh, and meet those candidates so we know what's, uh, what's coming up next. Okay. All right, Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good, good night. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.